Good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. So I just want to take a bit of a step back. I think um, my colleagues before me have laid a great foundation for what I'm going to say today. Because I'm really going to focus on two things. One is entrepreneurship and how do we drive the businesses and start the businesses that are really going to fuel the demand that we need to grow broadband penetration. And the second part is just to look a bit about the content and look at some of the intellectual property issues around them. Um, and if you step back and you start to think, if we're talking about broadband and driving broadband, what does that mean? At the end, it means how are we going to drive content? That's all it is. What's the content that we're going to push down these pipes? Um, so then you start asking yourselves, how do we get to the point where we have content producers? So it's fine to have an Al Jazeera, which is, you know, now we're in the business for 14 years, um, a worldwide international news channel with a network of sports channels, um, well-funded, um, going around and, you know, you can have the BBC and you can have these other big companies. Um, but that's only half of the story. Because when you really start looking at the traffic online, um, lots of traffic comes to us, lots of traffic may go to Vodafone and your airways, but most of the traffic are really going to companies that were started by two guys in a garage. So I want to just step back and talk about that a bit and how do we try to encourage that within the broader region. Because I think when we start seeing these two guys in the garage starting these companies, that's when you're really going to see a broad, broadband take off, you're going to see lo content localized, and you're really going to start seeing the innovation happen. So if I can just take you back to um, the pre-internet era, um, and when people were trying to innovate, it was really hard. You know, it was governments and corporations and experts and bodies and panels um, and funding papers and research departments and all sorts of things. And to get anything done required a lot of work and a lot of effort. But if we move forward to the internet era, the era that we're in at the moment, innovation is totally different. It's simple, it's fast, and there's a number of components making up this ecosystem. And what the challenge that we face now, especially in this region, is how do we nurture this ecosystem? So, you know, if we just look at this, when you start looking at you know, how these companies form up, you start looking at what this ecosystem looks like, and it's, and it's simple. Innovation's at the edge. It's not in the center. It's not with some centralized body. It's pushed out to the edge. It's the companies on the edge. It's the people on the edge. It's entrepreneurs, um, the venture capitalists who are funding it. And it's all built on top of this cloud, which we call the internet. And underlying this are sets of standards that are open. Um, everybody can plug into them. Everybody can use them. There's a stack that works. There's an open source layer around it, which makes it cheap and easy for people to start building on. So if you, if you look at the, a Google or the next Google, what are they going to build it on? You know, it's going to be two guys out at Qatar University or Qatar Foundation, um, and they can have a web server that costs, you know, a couple of dollars to rent a month. That web server is going to be running Apache software, which is free. Um, it's going to be running a MySQL database. It's going to be running on a Linux operating system. All of these components are free. Um, and these are solid platforms which everybody uses, from Google to Facebook to Yahoo um, to Al Jazeera itself. And so the cost to entry is cheap. It's nearly nothing. It trends towards zero. When you look at when Google was started, it was two guys in Stanford running servers in their bedrooms in a dormitory. So the cost to start something up, as it tends towards zero, what it means is the cost of failure goes to zero as well. It's cheap to fail. Now, we always look at failure as a bad thing. You failed. You, it, you know, it might be shameful to start something and have it fail. But the only way you're actually going to get to the next big idea is by failing, and failing multiple times. Because you're going to strike that one thing that takes off. And because it costs us so little to fail multiple times, it, that's the only way we're going to succeed in innovating and trying things out. And especially in this time when business models are uncertain. No one knows how are we going to make money of news. How are we going to make money of music a couple of years ago when Napster was around. Everybody was trying to figure this out. No one could sit down and you couldn't get uh, McKinsey to come and tell you how it's going to be done. Because no one knew. Everybody was trying to figure it out. So the only way you could do it was by trying it. I have a group of entrepreneurs in your organization outside and let them try it. Try a couple of things, you fail, you throw it out after six months. If they're good entrepreneurs, they'll pivot, they'll change direction, and they'll make a success out of it. So this cost of failure is critical. You know, and this is what we should be encouraging people. Try it, fail. Now there's a whole ecosystem around this, right? It's not just Joe walks off the street and decides to start a company. There has to be people who can fund these companies. There has to be venture capitalists and angel investors around them. There needs to be people who can acquire these companies so they can have a liquidity event. And then once you're acquired, they're going to go on and fund the next generation of entrepreneurs. So with this whole ecosystem that needs to be nurtured and built. So if we just go to a, and zoom in on Qatar itself, 
if you look at the Kitchery market and you, know, you look at the Lexa numbers, which are the best we have, if you look at the players, who are the big players on the web? You know, you're looking at Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, Facebook, Wikipedia, and Kitter Living. So that's what you have. Those are your big six, eventually, right? Now, the interesting thing about all of them, uh, you know, all of them were started by two guys in the basement. That's what they are, or a guy in his dormitory at university. These are your big players driving your consumer demand. If you, you know, I, I'm sure my colleagues from Vodafone will tell you this. All the traffic's going to Google. It's going to YouTube. It's going to Facebook. You know, they, it's going to Flickr where people are posting these photos. This is where the traffic's going. All these companies were started by two guys with no funding. At some point, they raised a little bit of money. They probably got angel investors who gave them $100,000. They ran these companies. Then they went up and raised some venture capital, and they built them into billion-dollar businesses.